I appreciate this time. And what I'd like to do is just do a short interview with you and follow up in a week or two and just kind of keep a, a conversation going as uh, people get become more acquainted with you, our readership. And um, I did uh, have an interview with uh, Darren Bailey yesterday afternoon. So it's uh, already becoming very active in the gubernatorial uh, campaign. And um, I was looking at your website. I kind of went over this with him a little bit yesterday. Um, his, um, to me, when I look at a candidate's website and I see what their issues are, to me, that's their priorities. That's what they want to base their campaign on those topics. And so your three topics are responsible government, safe communities, and uh, economic growth through capitalism. Those are the three points. And um, I just wanted to kind of just talk about each one of those, if you don't mind, just a brief review, because these evidently are your your key emphasis. So let's talk. Well, I, yeah, and I I absolutely am, am happy to happy to do that. I think it's probably worthwhile though to just do a little bit of background uh, before that, just in terms of so so the. Uh, you know, so your readers can understand, you know, why I am talking about those, those issues. Uh, you know, I think if anybody looks at my voting record, you know, they will know that I am a pragmatic conservative. And, you know, I care, you know, very deeply about conservative issues. That's why I am, I am in politics, you know, because I do want to, you know, move our, our state and our country in a, in a conservative direction. However, if we're going to win this election against Governor Pritzker, uh, our candidate has to be able to do three things. Uh, and this, this, is, uh, this, is, this assumes that you have the money to get your message out. Uh, any Republican candidate, uh, even if they have unlimited resources, you know, like a Ken Griffin, they are still going to have to be able to do three things to win in Illinois. And those three things are, you're going to have to reunite our badly fractured Republican party. You're also going to have to be able to give the voters a contrast uh, between yourself and J.B. Pritzker. And that's not only a policy contrast, it also needs to be a life story contrast and then the third thing that any successful Republican candidate has to do in Illinois is you have to be able to get crossover voters. And in order to, and the reason I say that is at this point, you know, because of the amount of resources that Governor Pritzker brings to the table, and because of the very progressive voting laws we now have in Illinois, where you have vote by mail and you have the ability to. Uh, harvest ballots, uh, the Democrat, uh, the, the size of the Democrat base turnout is just so much larger at this point than the Republican, the potential Republican base turnout. If you look at all the votes that President Trump got this year in Illinois, and you know, the conventional wisdom, and this is true, that usually voter turnout is much, much higher in a presidential election year than an off-year election, which is where when we have our governor election, uh, you know the the amount of votes that President Trump got this past election cycle in Illinois was uh, 2.4 million votes. Governor Pritzker back in 2018, which was an off-year election, Governor Pritzker got almost 2.5 million votes. So Governor Pritzker in an off year in 2018 got more votes than President Trump just got here in 2020. And the lesson that I take away from that is that the Democratic floor in terms of the minimum amount that if they spend their money and get their base out to vote, their floor is now higher than our ceiling. You know, I think President Trump got all the conservative votes, you know, that were there to be gotten in Illinois. So if we're going to win as a Republican 
in Illinois, if we're going to, if a Republican candidate is going to win this governor election, you have to have crossover votes. And the way you get crossover votes is not by talking about what divides us, but it's by talking about what unites us as a people of Illinois. And those are the issues that I think unite us as people of Illinois. And that's what I think the Republican Party needs to stand for, is the uh, responsible government, safe communities, and economic growth through capitalism. And that's why, you know, that's the, those are the issues that I'm emphasizing on my campaign website. Now, that doesn't mean we don't talk about other issues in Illinois. That doesn't mean we don't talk about the Second Amendment or we don't talk about the pro-life issue, you know, but we need to have those discussions within the broader framework of responsible government, safe communities, and economic growth through the free market or capitalism. Let me just pick up on that last point because sad to say, we are now at a point that capitalism is controversial in the state, uh, in the nation. You know, there's a whole movement to move ahead uh, without capitalism or to to limit capitalism. Could we just um, kind of talk about your emphasis on that to, to start there? Because um, even though you know it should be, you would uh, you would think it would be a uniting uh, issue. Capitalism is controversial right now, and that is just amazing, but it's the fact. So how do you address that to do the crossover votes um, with focusing on economic development with capitalism? Well, I think the way that we can do that is we can really focus on all of the uh, administrative overreach that state agencies in Illinois have engaged in. Over the past two years, I had the opportunity to sit on the Joint Committee for Administrative Rules. And it was just, it was amazing to me, just the sheer volume of rules that Illinois administrative agencies are producing. And I've seen how those rules can, can just choke the life out of small business in Illinois. And, you know, while, uh, you know, socialism may look good on, on paper uh, to some of our uh, younger voters that have not had experience in the real world yet. You know, when you give them the opportunity to tell, uh, you tell stories about how businesses are dying because of excessive government regulations. When we talk about how the government is picking winners and losers and how that impacts their lives on a daily basis, you know, that is how uh, we change people's minds. On this issue of the free markets versus socialism, we have, to, we have to win on this issue. We have to change some hearts and minds. We need, uh, we, we need people to engage and talk about, you know, why top-down or government-down planning is absolutely the wrong way to go. You know, this is something where the, uh, where the Policy Institute you know, has, you know, has done great work. This is something where we have a lot of, uh, a lot of very smart, remarkable conservative thinkers in the state. And we need to, we need to really uh, not run away from this issue. We need to stand firm and talk about how it is the free market and it is capitalism that is, you know, the, uh, the, the generator of wealth and prosperity not the Illinois government, because the, you know, the Illinois, go Illinois government is what is holding our, our state back. It's not, it's not a help, it's, it's a hindrance. Okay, um, to, to come along that way, then we're gonna work backwards because another controversial thing is just happened this week on the safe communities issue that you bring up. Here we have uh, two different ways of looking at of creating safe communities in the state of Illinois. We have a law enforcement bill, uh, law that was signed in. You, you made a public statement about that. How do you see um, a, a contrasting view on how uh, with where we're headed right now as compared to how you would like to make safe communities? Well, this is really one of the areas where there is very, I mean, there, there's a lot of areas where there is a bright line difference uh, between 
uh, Governor Pritzker and myself. Uh, but this is an area where I don't have to uh, do very much work explaining it. Uh, I think that our law enforcement personnel represent what is best about America. Uh, they are heroes who put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe. And I, what was, to me, the most troubling part of uh, House Bill 3653 was the manner that we went about doing this as an Illinois General Assembly. You know, I just think that our law enforcement community, uh, because they put their lives on the line for us, they deserve to be at the table whenever there is any talk of changing the way they have to do business fundamentally. And they were not at the table during the drafting of this bill. In fact, they were deliberately excluded. They were kept in the dark uh, and they did not, you know, they were not allowed to have input on what was going to be, you know, in the final version of this bill. Then, you know, it, it got to the point where, uh, you know, I was, I was sitting in the, in the Illinois Capitol. This was a, a lame duck session. Uh, you know, first of all, they shouldn't have had, you know, a lame duck session. This deserved to be taken up in a regular session. But we were sitting there, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, we're thinking that we are going to be finished at 9 p.m., then 10 p.m., you know, it gets to be, you know, one in the morning, two in the morning, and then finally at 4 a.m. is when uh, the Democrats had, you know, what they thought was the final version of this bill ready to go. Uh, so they called us back in the session at 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, made a floor amendment, which is they're changing, uh, they're changing the content of the bill, uh, but because they're doing it on the floor of the Senate, uh, nobody, had, nobody was able to see those changes on their computers. Nobody knew what the actual legislation said. And then this bill passed at 4.45 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I view that process as a slap in the face to every member of our law enforcement community. They deserved to have this measure debated during regular process in a full transparent manner. You know, and if, if the changes that you're looking to make are good changes, why do you have to do it in secret? You know, why do you have to rush it in if it's something that's going to stand the test of time? You know, one of the things that I've been saying lately is the truth is not afraid of transparency. You know, what are you hiding, you know, if, you're, uh, if your proposal is a good one? So what finally, you know, what ultimately passed was something that was adamantly opposed by nearly every single law enforcement group in the state of Illinois. You know, they feel that this is going to make their job much more difficult with the elimination of cash bail, which, you know, cash bail wasn't perfect, uh, but that doesn't mean we need to get rid of it altogether. This also puts some very new expensive mandates on a lot of our local police departments that local communities are not sure they're going to be able to, to comply with. Uh, so this is something, this bill was something that our law enforcement our law enforcement community was adamantly opposed to. And I think, I simply think we owed them the courtesy of, of listening to them and at least giving them a seat at the table and hearing out their concerns rather than rushing through something that nobody really knew what was in it. One can only imagine how lawmakers would feel if uh, the citizens got together and decided a bunch of things that affected them without asking, right? I mean, that's exactly where I would uh, make that comparison. Um, well, that leads. Right that, that, is, that, is, that is a good analogy. It would, like, it would be like, okay, the, uh, the citizens are going to have, have a closed door meeting and decide you know, what the, uh, what the lawmakers' salaries are going to be, and then also maybe decide whether we're going to be, uh, we're going to be liable, you know, in, in court for some bad legislation, you know, that, you know, that, that we passed. You know, that is an interesting, that is an interesting analogy, and, and you're absolutely right. The, uh, the, my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, would not be happy at all if their fate was being decided behind closed doors and they didn't have any input on it. Which leads us back to the top point on your website, which was responsible government. And I think you pretty much have 
uh, emphasize your concerns. I mean, that's it, what you just said is an example of irresponsible government. Well, and what I mean by responsible government, too, is government that is doing what it's supposed to be doing. For instance, if you're already running a large budget deficit, you don't increase government spending. You don't increase taxes on people uh, without trying to cut spending first. Uh, responsible government is also having the General Assembly provide legislative oversight to Governor Pritzker's pandemic executive orders. Uh, it is extremely troubling that we are moving away uh, from the legislature doing its job, providing oversight, and Governor Pritzker is running this state via executive order. Uh, that is something that, you know, bad on the leaders of the General Assembly for letting him get away with it, but it also reflects badly on him. And that's not, that is something I would do completely different if I were governor. Uh, government power is something that needs to be wielded, if at all, just like a scalpel. Uh, instead, Governor Pritzker is wielding uh, the power of the state of Illinois like a sledgehammer. Uh, we do need a governor who, is going, who understands uh, that government that governs best is government that governs least. Governor Pritzker you know, simply has shown uh, no, uh, no willingness to recognize any limits whatsoever on his power. He needs to be held accountable for that. He also, though, uh, has been an absentee governor in terms of uh, he wasn't paying attention during the, uh, during the spate of deaths at the LaSalle Veterans Home due to COVID-19. Uh, he, he only held uh, Director Chapelavia accountable, you know, after a number of weeks where the facts came out that she was absolutely uh, failing in her mission. But he should have also held Dr. Azike, uh, his head of the Illinois Department of Public Health, accountable as well. Uh, it's ridiculous that that facility, one of the reasons that you had the, uh, the COVID outbreak running rampant in that facility was they were using a type of hand sanitizer that did not kill the virus. And had the Illinois Department of Public Health been inspecting that facility in a timely manner, they could have identified the fact that uh, the wrong hand sanitizer was being used. You know, that is just uh, gross incompetence, and the governor should have held somebody accountable for that. Uh, IDPH has not performed very well during this pandemic. Uh, they were using a metric, uh, the positivity rate, which was the wrong metric to be using. Governor Pritzker, even uh, when he announced his mitigation plan back on July 15th with the positivity rate as the centerpiece of this mitigation plan, this was the metric that was going to be used to determine whether we were going to destroy livelihoods and shut down businesses. Governor Pritzker announced that mitigation plan and in the very same press conference, he answered a question where he, you know, he gave what he thought was an explanation for the positivity rate, and he clearly didn't understand what the positivity rate was. That's just a catastrophic leadership failure that you're, uh, you're announcing a plan that's going to shut down businesses and destroy livelihoods based on a metric that you as the governor clearly did not understand. And that's something that your readers don't have to take my word for, they can go back and watch the press conference themselves. You go back, it's July 15th, watch it like the 48 minute mark of that press conference. He gets a question about a higher positivity rate in Missouri and he says, well, you know, if you go to Missouri where the positivity rate is double that of Illinois, that means you're gonna have twice the chance of getting exposed to COVID. No, absolutely not. Completely wrong. The positivity rate was just based on testing and, you know, it was completely dependent on, you know, what the pool of testing results were, how many tests were being, being given. But Governor Pritzker thought that the positivity rate meant, you know, the rate of the general public that was infected. 
absolutely catastrophic leadership failure on his part. And that's how we go after him. That's how we win this election. We win this election by showing that Governor Pritzker has been a catastrophic failure as a leader. He does not understand the challenges that the people of Illinois face. He has no clue what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck or wake up in the morning wondering how you're going to pay for your kid's education. He doesn't listen and he doesn't stand up to the special interest groups on his side of the aisle that have wreaked havoc on our once great state. Well, I want to thank you for taking time to point out all of these things that it doesn't seem like the, the mainstream media is going to help us on this. Uh, they, they, I have found in, uh, that they tend to protect the Democrats, and um, that is a very sad commentary for media. But this is how we get the message directly. And, and uh, I... All of the things that you listed, any one of them ought to be major enough for the people, the voters of Illinois to consider someone else and to take us in a different direction for the state of Illinois, in my personal opinion. But um, just a brief um, bio for you, just to acquaint and remind people your background just uh, quickly as we close up here. Sure. Well, uh, I spent my adult life in the United States Marine Corps, first as, as an infantry officer and then as a prosecutor for the Marines. Uh, you know, some of your readers may remember me from 2014. I got out of the Marine Corps, came back to Illinois because this is my home, and I ran for Illinois Attorney General against Lisa Madigan because I felt like uh, Illinois was ready to have an Attorney General who was not a political insider in either party. And we came up short in that campaign, but I was very proud of the campaign we, we ran. Uh, it, was very tough to, it was very tough to raise money and get our message out, but we still flipped 44 counties that the previous, uh, the previous election, Lisa Madigan had won. We flipped those counties and got them to, to vote for me. We held Lisa Madigan, who was the most popular politician in the, in the state at the time, we held her under 60%. Uh, that shocked the political establishment. I really think that led to her deciding, you know what, I, I don't wanna, don't wanna have to you know, run for reelection in 2018. But after that, uh, after that 14 campaign, I thought my political career was over. Uh, I you know, took a position in a small law firm in Columbia, Illinois, which is close to where I live. And how I got sucked back into politics was uh, my state senator, Dave Luchtefeld, who I have an enor enormous amount of respect for, he asked me, uh, he was retiring, and he asked me to, uh, to run for his seat. And if he had not been the one doing the asking, you know, I would not have gotten back in. But I ran for the Illinois Senate in 2016. I took on former Lieutenant Governor Sheila Simon, who you know, was very well liked in my district, had tremendous name ID, and, you know, had the full resources of the Democratic Party. She wound up, wound up outspending me by uh, over 300,000 in that election, but yet we still won that race by over 22 percent. And this was a district that is a very uh, kind of diverse, in a non-politically correct way, district, uh, lots of different equities, uh, union families, very conservative areas, uh, progressive areas, agriculture, uh, coal, oil and gas, uh, just a very, uh, very diverse district. And we won it by 22 points. Uh, so I was the state senator from 2017 to 2021. The reason that I did not run for reelection is at the time that I was uh, at the time, I would have had to file my petitions to run for re-election. I was being considered by F President Trump for one of the judicial vacancies in the Southern District of Illinois. In fact, I was President Trump's top choice uh, to fill one of those vacancies. And I had gotten a phone call saying, OK, congratulations. We're going to announce your nomination tomorrow. Uh, two hours later, I got a second phone call saying, well, we're not quite ready to go yet. And what I found out happened later on was that Senator Durbin uh, had let me go through the entire process 
And then when they were ready to announce my nomination, uh, he objected and said that he was not going to return his blue slip based on pro-life statements I had made back in the 2014 attorney general campaign. And eventually, uh, Senator Durbin told the White House, look, I'll let, I'll let you fill it with other people. I'm just not going to let Schimpf go through. And the U.S. Senate you know, was honoring the blue slip process at that time. So Durbin had the ability to, uh, you know, to put a stop to my federal judge nomination. And that all went down, you know, after, you know, it was too, it was too late to run for reelection. And I, I wasn't going to run for reelection while the judge thing was, was going on because honestly, I don't believe politics is a career. It's a temp job. And I strongly feel that you have no right to run for one position if you're angling for something else. It would, you know, the people of my district deserve to have a candidate who was committed to being their state senator. Now, when the judge thing fell through, you know, that made kind of like two changes to my personal life. <laughs> uh, first, uh, that did tick my wife off a lot. And the reason it's important is I had said I would never run statewide again, uh, simply because I was not gonna be able to get spouse buy off. You know, as somebody that lives uh, 30 minutes south of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, running a statewide campaign is a, uh, is a strain on my family. And there was no way my wife was going to ever let me do that again. But after the whole federal judge debacle, my wife, Lori, changed her mind and said, hey, if you want to run statewide, go for it. Uh, her words were actually a little bit more colorful than that, but I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll just leave it as the, uh, as the sentiment that she, that she gave. But not being a state senator also freed me up to be able to run statewide. Uh, honestly, I would have never run statewide again if I was representing my district uh, in the Illinois General Assembly, just because it's a district that is a huge district geographically. It's very far down state. And if you're going to run successfully statewide in Illinois, you need to be spending at least half your time in the Chicagoland area. And I would not have been able to represent and advocate for my district and spend the necessary amount of time in my district and be a statewide candidate at the same time. So uh, it really had, had the judge thing not fallen through, I would not be running for governor here today. And I guess really the last thing that I do want to make sure your readers understand is there have been some of the talking heads in Chicago who have said, uh, Paul Schimpf is going to run a downstate centric campaign. That is absolutely incorrect. Uh, I do have family in the, uh, in the western suburbs. Uh, my mother-in-law is kind enough to let me, uh, let me have my base of operations out, at, out of her house. So I will be spending you know, half of every week up in Chicago. I'm going to put in the time to get to know the people of the Chicago area, remind them who I am. And I am going to fight for every vote in the Chicago region. This is not going to be this is not going to be a downstate campaign. Very informative.